Being a writer is a creative journey to a destination no one actually arrives. From novice to expert, we all have things we need to learn and understand in this creative journey. In this video we put together three important lessons from one of our writers and we hope it helps you in one way or the other. By the way, welcome to Pacnuel. Don't forget to hit the like button, leave a comment below, share this video, and subscribe to this channel. Content is king. If your business is dependent on web traffic, you'll probably be very familiar with this three-worded sentence. In a world where the quality of write-ups you create can decide just how much progress you make in your business, writing is not just a highly treasured skill, it is fast approaching the threshold of becoming a necessity. You could say, good content means good business. Unique, relevant, interesting, and high-quality content contributes immensely to the success of companies on the internet. However, today we are not talking about what content can do for you. Instead, we are talking about what you can do for content. I used to tell my writer friends that if content is king, then content writers are kingmakers. Well, good content writers, anyway. For me, I grew up writing and writing then grew into me. To be honest, I started my writing journey by mistake. I never really believed I could be a writer until people made me believe it. I always had a thing for creative writing back in elementary school, but it centered mostly on my desire to become a movie villain. Don't worry, I certainly ditched the idea. Since then to when I, really, started writing, I never really saw myself sitting with a pen and a notebook. I didn't believe writing was my thing, though I sure liked playing with words. My writing journey may not be awe-inspiring, but it's definitely not a cliché. I came from barely being able to string together intelligible words to getting my work published on big websites and blogs. Even at that, my first published work was an eyesore. It was the definition of everything a writer shouldn't be doing. I'm proud of how far I have come, but I can't particularly say I'm a great writer, far from it. But I've learned a lot of valuable lessons in my few years of writing. I've also picked up a lot of great habits, habits every content writer should have. I'll be sharing with you three important lessons I have learned in my journey as a web content writer. 1. Time and perfection will be your greatest enemy. Honestly, I used to have a serious problem with time management and perfectionism. It is one of those things that crippled my ability to write. Perfectionism was the bunker buster for me, it affected every single piece of creative writing I did. I even had problems with submitting contents I was working on because literally every time I get ready to submit, I felt like my opening paragraph or paragraph 2 and 3 aren't good enough and need to be revised. As a result, just one write-up would end up taking what felt like centuries because I constantly thrust myself into a mental torture over how this or that aspect of my work is going to be judged by readers. We all ought to feel this way about our work. However, the trick is not allowing your perfectionist tendencies to hold you back from making progress in your work. In my opinion, as long as you've genuinely put in your best to craft a piece of writing, perfectionism is absolutely pointless. Why? Well, because what is a perfect piece of writing for you may end up being a jaw-dropping mediocre to someone else. Conversely, what you believe is mediocre may get to a reader in a way you never expected. I think one of the most important factor in the scheme of things is the experience of the audience. Once, you can always learn to let go and hand it over to the audience, then you can let go of the idea of perfectionism. Perfectionism is a major impediment to productivity and I learned, and I'm still learning, to overcome this by focusing more on the actions and not the result. When you're overly focused on the result you raise the bar of your expectations too high. This makes you much more susceptible to being dissatisfied. To overcome perfectionism, I practice stepping back for a moment, especially when I'm deep in the right, delete, right, delete cycle and telling myself that it's likely my standards are super high. Don't get me wrong, a super high standard could be a good thing, but when it gets you stuck in a 2000 word article for 3 days, it becomes a nuisance. What's the difference between a clean plate and a perfectly clean plate? Well, as a perfectionist you can probably tell, but always remember that most people wouldn't. When you think something is, okay, but not yet perfect, it may be time to come to terms with the fact that, okay, is probably good enough in most cases. Seeing the good in my work. The other day I came across an article one wrote for a tech blog few years ago. Immediately I set eyes on the first few paragraphs, I was utterly disgusted. What was this crap? 
Who is this verbose and arrogant writer? I immediately saw things I could have done better. Since my writer's credentials with the blog happened to be valid, I immediately hit the edit button and rejigged the whole thing up. In the process, I learned a valuable lesson. I was content with what I did in few minutes but would find it hard to come to terms with what I spent hours working on. Why was this so? Because I saw the good in the work I did. Because what I had before wasn't so great, it was so easy to see the good in the new additions I made. However, it could be less easier to see the brilliance in a work you're currently invested in. Everywhere you look, creative individuals struggle with liking their own work. For a lot of people, this dissatisfaction occurs nearly every time the right. The key to overcoming this is seeing the small bits of brilliance you've etched here and there in that work you've painstakingly written. Timing myself. When you feel you have all the time in the world, you're tempted to use it. Believe me, I've been there, done that, doesn't ever end well. One method that have helped me break through the barrier of perfectionism is putting limits on the time I allot to myself for a writing task. Always push yourself to work more quickly, and adhere strictly to your allotted time. Sure, it could be painful at times, but the more you do it, the easier it will become. 2. Find a niche and stick to it. It's quite true that nobody is perfect. Everyone is good at certain things but not so great at others. The most athletic kid back then in high school was probably not the brightest in class. Similarly, the brightest in class probably wasn't the best at long-distance races. When I first started off writing for websites and blogs, I usually scoffed at the idea of settling with a specific niche. I believed there were way too many things I wanted to write about. I thought to myself, I shouldn't be monogamous in my writing. So like any amateur web content writer, I plowed the field. I wrote about topics I was interested in. I wrote about those I wasn't interested in. I wrote and wrote till I built up a rather wide-reaching and diverse portfolio for myself. This was exciting and I was happy at first. However, as time went on, I needed to improve. As a freelancer, it was immensely important that I was on top of my game. Unfortunately, it seemed almost impossible to improve with the numerous number of fields I needed to build expertise on. As many freelance writers eventually learn, businesses are looking to hire specialized talent to create their content. The need specialized talent to tell their brand stories. The need specialized talent to run their content marketing campaigns. Why? Because specializing means greater expertise. Because specializing means you know the nitty gritty of what you're writing about. Because companies may not have the luxury to teach freelancers about the peculiarities of their industry. Looking at it from a job opportunity point of view, companies want to know that the person they'll be assigning a task knows the relevant industry statistics and the necessary lingo to flow well. The want someone who knows the niche enough to shape all those details into stories that can capture the attention of their target audience. Try putting yourself in the perspective of a brand. Why waste time and money starting from scratch with a writer who is talented, but simply doesn't get it? There are millions of writers out there, what makes you stand out? If you're just starting out as a writer, or even if you've already built a reasonably strong portfolio but are hearing this advice for the first time, choosing a niche might seem stressful. For some, choosing a niche might feel like you're about to hamstring your potential. But the fact remains that if you approach niche selection as a process that happens gradually over time, you'll come to realize that it's a huge strength rather than a weakness. What do you enjoy reading? When you're jugging in the morning, or commuting in public transport what topics regularly linger in your mind? What kind of writing projects do you enjoy most and can deliver effortlessly? Of all your recent writing tasks, which should you find yourself quite invested in? These are all clues that can point you to your niche. Against what most of us choose to tell ourselves, you can only produce great contents in a very limited number of writing niches. Emphasis on very limited. You must have heard people proclaim being able to produce great contents in any niche they set their mind on. If you're one of them, you might want to have a rethink. Irrespective of the number of hours you put into a job, you're always not going to be at your best in what simply isn't yours. For you, your area of comfort may be this and for the other it may be that. I'm not particularly the poetic type, even after repeated trials, poetry doesn't seem to sink in with me. This means, when I'm trying to complete a writing task that requires a fair amount of poetic bravery, I almost always have a hard time. Of course for you it may be a little different. You can get some momentary inspiration and pull through in things that aren't particularly your home turf. 
However, what isn't yours just isn't yours. There are many ways a writer can find a niche to settle with. Some experts recommend picking your favorite subject, devouring as much information on it as possible and going all in for it. Others recommend a little dabbling here and there across different niches to see what you're good at. Take it from someone who has been there, done that, settling with a niche can save time and help you become particularly excellent at writing. 3. If you're having self-doubt, it's entirely normal. Okay, maybe not entirely. But one important lesson I have learned throughout my writing career and interaction with several other writers is that self-doubt always creeps in. No matter what you do, or what you've achieved as a writer, Whichever kind of writer you are, self-doubt will always be there. Your self-doubt may mutate, reduce and sometimes even go away. But it always comes back. This is quite an uncomfortable topic, but it's the ugly truth. When self-doubt knocks at your door, it hits you badly, trips you up and bites at the back of your neck right when you're building your skills or in the middle of your success. It drains the confidence out of you, but it's very important to be prepared for it. Whenever it knocks, you should understand that as a writer self-doubt does not mean you suck. It does not mean you don't have what it takes. However, most times, writer's self-doubt is in fact, a liar. You should understand that your self-doubt is a manifestation of your inner critic, who is, as we've established, a jerk. I know this from the few years of experience I have under my belt, and it's not only me. There are thousands of well-known writers across different fields that have publicly stated their experience with self-doubt. Still not convinced? Have you ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Just in case you haven't, it's a psychological principle that means that the most incompetent are usually the most confident, while the truly intelligent ones doubt their own abilities. To put succinctly, it means the dumb people are too dumb to know how dumb they are while the smart ones are clever enough to know how much they don't know. British philosopher Bertrand Russell put it in a very nice way. The trouble with the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. As a writer, it's highly likely you've experienced something in that alley before. Thank you for watching this video, do note that this was shared as an article on our website. Would you want to read this and more helpful stories? Log on to www.pacnuel.com.